Hey guys, welcome to the shop. This week I have got a few jobs that I'm gonna share with you. One is gonna be a little bit time consuming and we'll start off on that and we'll see how far we get. But thank you for watching. We're gonna be using hopefully the milling machine, maybe the milling machine. I know we're gonna be using the shaper and we'll use the surface grinder a little bit too. So thank you for watching. Let me show you what we're gonna get into and let's get started. So I've been asked to work a couple miracles here. Actually, a buddy of mine wants to turn this piece of what he says is either cast iron or ductile iron that has been looking like it's set in a bucket of water for six years into a precision straight edge so he can scrape in the compound on a small lathe. Now, uh, what I've been asked to do, because he doesn't have the equipment to do it himself, is to rough this out into the shape of a straight edge and then he's gonna be doing the scraping to bring this into to real precision. So, it is a long way away, wow from a coveted, treasured piece of tooling. But you get the idea. We're, our job is to make it look like something. Maybe drill and tap the ends, put an angle on it so it can do dovetails as well. You get it about a foot long, yeah, 11 and a half by, I don't know, inch and a half, let's say by the time we're done wide, by three quarters of an inch thick. That's what we got to work with. So we'll start off on the surface grinder. We will get us two nice parallel sides, then we'll stick it in the shaper and maybe go to the milling machine as well. I'm not sure. We'll see how this stuff machines. So let's start off at the surface grinder and uh, you know get this thing cleaned up to where I can clamp it in my vise. So before I stick this down on the mag chuck, I wanna get all the bumps and the crusties off of it, as good as I can anyway. I mean, it ain't gotta be perfect but I don't wanna stick that down on the mag chuck with any, any raised areas. So what we'll do, that side that I just ran the file over, we'll stick that on the mag chuck, we'll dust off this side, then we'll flip it, and we'll dust off this side, we'll have two nice parallel sides that we can stick in the vise and, and that we can you know, clamp to really good. So that's the idea, let's go over to the surface grinder and blast off the two sides of this, just get them nice and clean, that's all we're after. So let's fire up and warm up the old MicroMaster because it does, this machine likes to be started and ran for a few minutes before you start using it. Get those fluids moving and warmed up, kind of like me in the morning. It takes a little bit to pour, before it smooths out really nice. It just makes sense. So while that grinder's warming up, I'm gonna throw a log on the fire. Warm up the shop as well. Keep the dust down. Maybe help this wheel from clogging, not for sure. We'll use a little coolant. Shouldn't hurt anything. Thank <laughs> you. 
So this machine has the direct drive spindle, which is plenty strong. You can hog off for a grinder, I guess, of this size. You can hog off material pretty good with it. I've never owned one of the belt-driven spindles before, but I've heard they're a lot less powerful. That is looking pretty good. Got one or two little hits left in it, but I think that side is probably good enough. That is the sides. Now we can put it in the shaper vise and work the top, bottom, and the ends. So I gotta get this old shaper warmed up, get its juices flowing this morning. Lights dim when I start this thing up. And out of gear. And if I pull the handle to make it go, where this machine has a mechanical oil pump in it, you know, it starts pumping, starts oiling everything before anything moves other than the, the motor, right? Before almost anything moves. You can see it's got a tower there with a glass in it that tells you, you know, it's a visual reassurance that the machine is oiling because these are dependent, very dependent on a good oiling system. There's a lot of sliding surfaces on this machine. So I powered down the shaper just for a second because I want to show you a little comparison really quick between both of my surface grinders that I've got. Right now, uh, I've got a Kent, the big, the one that I've had for years, a big blue 8 by 18 uh, hydraulic surface grinder, and then the one that we just used, and that is a 618 MicroMaster Brown and Sharp. So I just went over there and I touched up this one surface on this parallel, on both of them actually, just touched them up. And I wanted to show you the difference in the grind quality between those two grinders super quick. Now, if you look at this surface, this was done with a MicroMaster, and I have taken a precision stone and I've ran over it just because the precision stone will show you if there's any dips or valleys or anything like that. And you can see that that is a pretty decent surface finish. It's not perfect, but I didn't try to make it perfect. I just blasted it really quick. Looks pretty good. Nice and even. There's no bands or anything across that. It looks looks nice but look at this side now I want you to disregard the scratches because this has been used but see those bands that run you know parallel or perpendicular to the length there of this part that's because the table of the Kent grinder the old blue one that I've got it runs on balls little balls that run in a, a v-way and the v-ways on that are slightly damaged probably from transport or something, the table's got to jarring around and it's put really small divots in the ways and when the table moves over those, those balls hit and it, and it shows those bands. It's still a 
perfectly fine grinder for the majority of stuff that you do, but there's a big comparison. The brown and sharp does not have ball ways. It has just, just standard V way, V flat. So you can see much nicer finish. You know, those are almost unmeasurable, but you get the idea. They show up in your finish when you run a precision stone over it. And uh, that's why I like the brown and sharp surface grinder better. It just leaves a nicer finish. Set the stroke up for 13 inches, and let's see where it's at. Almost perfect. Back just a little bit. That'll work. Let me show you the tool that we're going to use. So that's a piece of 5 8 I think that's uh, M2. And you can see it's got a nice large radius on it. So that should hold up for a while at least on this crusty, rough, probably glass hard surface. So we'll see. But uh, a really nice sharp point wouldn't hold up for probably two or three strokes on this. So we got a nice big radius there. It should should work. Pull off 50 just because I know I'm going to have to pull off that much and I want to get below the crust. And I'm going to do 10,000 step over, just slow, slow and easy. Heavy cut, relatively heavy cut, generally speaking, but on this, but just a slow step over to try to get below that hard surface if it does indeed have a really hard surface. So shapers do get a bit of an unfair rap as being slow. This looks slow. If I could run this thing five times faster than this, it would probably still be perfectly fine. The good thing about a shaper is that tooling is super cheap. No end mills to buy, nothing like that. A handful of high-speed steel, and you're good. If you're running a home shop or something, you got a second operation you need to do while you're doing something else on maybe even a small production job. You know, they're a neat piece of equipment. Perfectly capable of making very precise, one in good shape anyway, surfaces. 
So there we go, first pass complete. I didn't feel any real hard spots or anything in this. So I'm just gonna probably take another, another 20, I'm guessing. Maybe another 30. And uh, this side will be done, we'll flip it. And then I'll do the other side. Hello, little girl, what are you doing? You laying by the fire? Pull off 30, do a 20 thousandth step over, and I'm going to speed this thing up a bit. It's got a couple little hard spots in it. Pretty small though. I don't know if I can get below them or not. It won't. It shouldn't make much difference really. I'm just tapping it down against those parallels. That way it's seated firmly against them in the vise. And I'm feeling up under here to make sure they're making good contact. Pull off 20. See what that does. 20. 20. This guy's going to be disappointed. I suspected this all along, and that is there's not enough mass here to cut a big angle. I'll lose 30% of that material cutting this to an angle where it can reliably get up into dovetails, and then by the time he scrapes it in, it's going to be left. This thing's going to be like a piece of spaghetti. Just not enough mass. He's going to have to get a bigger piece of cast like that, something with some, you know, gravity to it for it to not be flexible. You may not be able to notice it bending, but if I cut any more off this, it's just, it's not going to maintain its shape. 
So what I'm going to do is just finish it on up, finish the ends, lop it off at 11 inches, boink, and then, uh, you know, he can scrape it in and use it just as a regular straight edge. But uh, one that will work dovetails, it will not be, unfortunately. But uh, you get the idea. That's just my call, my opinion, is that this is just not enough material to, to cut it down any farther and it be, and, main, and it maintain its accuracy. So let's just do a quick check here. See what we got straight off the shaper. That's a shaper finish, shaper finish. Knocked it down on some parallels. Let's pull out the old mics and just see how parallel is this dude off of the shaper. I suspect it will be within a couple thou, at least. So, 0 0.6548. 0 0.6548. 0 0.6546. So, yeah. Very, very nice. That old shaper is pretty accurate just for knocking this down on some parallels, you know, that's pretty good. So you may think that this is just dirty, soluble oil, but it's not. It's a machinist secret, actually. It's decaffeinated coffee. It's perfect for machining, stuff like that. You've probably never heard of it, but yeah, I'm not surprised. It is a closely guarded machinist secret.
So this drill is kind of dull, like me. But I'm, it's working. So I'm gonna continue on. the Cleveland number five. I should make myself a holster for this thing. It's one of my, it's just a great size tap wrench and one of my most favorites of all time. It will do the smaller, run the smaller taps. It'll run some of the, you know, medium to larger size taps. If you just had one, the Cleveland number five would, would get you by. So cast iron likes to fall down in the hole and pack it full. And it'll also jam your tap up, all that cast dust. So if you can tap them upside down, the stuff will fall out of the flutes in the tap. It just, just makes things easier on cast iron if you can flip it when you, or blow air or whatever in the hole while you're tapping it. Well, goodness, if I could hold on to something, be nice. And who's calling me? Looks pretty good for what it is. So I've got a quick job on this press that I want to share with you, that I want to do to this press, and that is adapt this handle to where it fits the drive, the square drive, the drive, the square drive on the mechanism that raises and lowers this thing better. Now it does have the same square drive in this handle. The original one that came on this machine, which I've got, is broken in half, and I don't have the other piece to it. And I want this thing to slide up on here properly like the original one did. When the original one slides up on, I mean, you have to purposefully slide it off. And this one fits up on there just enough to where, you know, you crank it and it flies off sometimes or you bump it and it flops off in the floor. I don't know how many times that's happened and that is why. So what we need to do is counterbore this more. I don't know if you can see that, but there is a round, there's a round bore in there that needs to be deeper. I want the front of this square drive to be flush with the front of this handle. That way this slides all the way up on here and it's more stable, more user friendly and won't flop off. So let's go see if we can't set this thing up in the lathe, the fore jaw somehow, indicate it and then bore this thing out. First, let's get a measurement and see how much deeper that bore in there needs to be. All right, let's see, we'll hold that up on there. So zero, yeah, and we will see how much deeper we need to go. 704 thousandths, or 17.88 millimeter is what we need to remove from the hex part in here. We're just gonna continue on with this bore size here, on back, 700 thousandths. So after messing around a few minutes on the lathe trying to see if I could get this indicated in in any decent amount of time, I failed. You can only hold this with three jaws in the four jaw. 
it just the handle interferes with it you can't get it dialed in and it's cast and irregular shaped so there's nothing to go off of i do have a nice flat surface on the back here that i can set on the base of the uh, milling vise and it just the end of the handle there just goes down inside of one of the uh, one of the T slots and if I just do that and snug it down I try to V block on it as well in there it just doesn't matter because it's cast and without the original fixture that they machined this thing with or making a super custom one for an accuracy level that's not required for what I'm doing I've decided that this is going to be good enough and we're going to use a milling machine and a boring head. So let's do it. So all I'm doing is moving right or left, X or Y, until I see the least amount of movement in one direction. And then I stop, go to the other direction, and just keep going back and forth until you get her dialed. I'm just checking along that entire bore up and down, making sure that it's setting relatively straight inside of here. And it looks pretty good. I'll take that. These are nice to have. This is a Char's brand. It's, it's worked great. Tighten it to your arm crunches. Then you know it's good enough. I'm not gonna try to do this all in one pass because I don't have the best hold on it. So I'm just, I just wanna get this boring bar out to the edge. That way I can go down and touch the ledge there because I don't have a DRO on this thing. I have to set, I have to set my depth. Well, I can just run this screw up and then screw the table up, but one way or another, I gotta get this, find this ledge because that's what I'm going off of. up. Yeah, I could use this, but we'll just do it this way. Run this guy up. Until that's solid. We know it ain't got to be perfect. So now we'll take the table up 700 thousandths, and then when we come down and hit our stop, we'll know we've went, you know, 700 thousandths. 
行。Speeding down by hand. Adjust this boring head out. We go. I think that's going to be good enough. I know it's going to be good enough. All right, test fit time. Oh man. Oh man, now that's not going to fly off now. Before I could just kind of hit it just lightly and it would kind of flop off that. Perfect. You know, something like that just makes me happy. I don't know why. Such a simple job, but now it actually fits the way that it should, and I don't feel like it's some, you know, hack job handle on there. It actually fits like the original one did.
All right, guys, that's it this week. Straight Edge did not turn out the way that I envisioned. There's just not enough material here. There's really not enough here to put a heavy angle on that that would properly work dovetails and be left with enough material you know, to have anything. I think as is, this could be scraped in, could get a nice little light weight straight edge out of it. But in order to get what the guy's gonna need, he's gonna need a bigger, just a bigger chunk. That's all there is to it. Something that won't be so flexible. So we'll have to finish that up in the future. The handle that I did turned out good, really good. Actually fits the way that it should, made me happy. So that's it this week. Man, I've been so busy, I hauled off probably 10,000 pounds, you know, nine, 10,000 pounds of scrap this week. We used Elizabeth's crew cab and uh, cleaned up around the yard quite a bit. Uh, went and got my son, you know, drove with the crew cab and a trailer and picked up a car uh, that we bought for my son, his first car. So he's super excited about that. And I've been working on it, you know, trying to you know, get all the little bugs and stuff out of it. And it's just been a busy week. So. Hope everybody had a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and all that stuff. Uh, I know that we did, and uh, it was my granddaughter's first Christmas as well. I'll show you guys her before too long. She's something. She's, she's a sweetie. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Viewers, patrons, subscribers, anyone who's helped me out whatsoever, it is much appreciated. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.